On Saturday, the APEC Business Advisory Council met with the APEC country's leaders to outline policy changes they'd like to see across a number of areas, including global warming. Sky Business reporter Kylie Merritt is at the International Broadcast Centre. Kylie? Thanks, Helen. Well, I'm here at, uh, at the International Broadcast Centre with Peter Charlton, who's actually one of the members of the APAC Business Advisory Council, um, who met Saturday morning with the leaders. Now, uh, Peter, a, a number of things came up. The, uh, the idea, I suppose, if you can just start for us and explain what is the idea of the meeting that you have with the leaders. About 10 years ago, the leadership of APEC, the leaders of the nations, said they want closer access to the business community of the whole region. They created the Business Council and they asked us to tell them annually what things they can address as leaders to improve business in their countries and across the region so that their economies grow better, their jobs grow and skills grow. All right, let's go through some of the key things you put forward at this meeting. Um, Doha obviously came up. Doha is number one on the uh, agenda, has been for four years. Uh, we are more demanding in our approach to the leaders to crack the puzzle get people back to the table, make the concessions, give a little uh, and get Doha approved and uh, on the way. Do you get a feeling that it's going to happen? Uh, well, Lamy uh, at the conference two days ago said he sees more opportunity. Um, the leaders feel that uh, it is doable, but it's the developed nations that are the problem in their agricultural process between Europe and America particularly. There's also been quite a lot of talk the week about an Asia-Pacific free trade agreement. Yeah. That was something else that you put forward? We certainly did. The Business Council devised this idea three years ago. It was endorsed last year. It was worthy of a lot of research and thought. If Doha does fail in totality, eventually the free trade area Asia-Pacific becomes a reality. Now, one of the other issues that you mentioned to me was, was labour and, and m mobility of labour in the region. What did you put forward to the leaders about that? Uh, recognition that it exists, recognition that there, there are, uh, is a need for common goals and common understanding. Philippines, as you know, has a lot of labour that goes to the world. Uh, it's their major source of income. The President of the Philippines said 11% of their GD GDP is, is staff going overseas. They said the best model is Hong Kong, who treat their people fairly. There are other nations that don't. They want that Hong Kong model taken to the world, and Mexico supported them. Now, on an another issue, climate change, um, there's been a, a lot coming from the business community um, about this throughout APEC, but of course, you know, for the past couple of years. What have you said to the leaders on climate change? That it's a reality. Business must grasp the opportunity to be decisive. We need clear guidelines. We need clear goals from the government to, uh, uh, to address the problem so we can go forward and invest in better models. All right, and just quickly, uh, something that's come up, and, and you know, it, it's obviously a, a recent thing, and that's the fallout from the subprime mortgage um, crisis in the states. That came up at the meeting as it well. It came up, and none of the leaders see it as a current problem. They see it as a blip, uh, a blip, but they see that their economies are growing fast. The world economy is still strong, and there's growth in the region. They think they can withstand another drop, uh, not a super severe one, but they don't think it will come. All right, Peter Charlton, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Helen, uh, Desley Coleman will be back later in the program with more from here at APEC. Kai, thank you. One of the most robust sessions of the APEC Business Summit this week centred on trade, specifically the stalled Doha round and whether regional agreements are still a viable alternative. During the sometimes heated discussion, countries were singled out for refusing to relax protection of specific industries like sugar. For those involved in negotiations, Australia's free trade agreement with the United States, the arguments must have sounded all too familiar. That agreement came into effect at the start of 2005. The question is, has it made a difference? Joining me now to discuss this is Dennis Richardson, Australian Ambassador to the United States. Mr Richardson, welcome. Thanks, Helen. Thank you for coming in. Now, Mr FTA, I just wanted to ask you a little bit trade this week at APEC. Now, we Australia signed a very big deal with China. We've signed a big deal on uranium with Russia. Is it too simplistic to say, where's the big deal with the United States, the big trade deal? Well, I think one that is a bit simplistic, but I'd make two points. First of all, the economic relationship that we have with the United States is by far the biggest we have with any, any country in the world. If you put investment and trade together, our economic relationship with the US is bigger than any other. The second point I'd make, uh, one of the things that was announced when President Bush and 
Prime Minister Howard um, at their joint press conference was the signing of the of the Defence Trade Treaty. Uh, that is a treaty uh, that will enable our defence industries to partner up with their US counterparts. It will significantly reduce the red tape that they're currently required to go through.